Um, but yes, I've come all the way from London. Um, my name's Jamie Coleman, and I'm here to talk to you about raw materials in your applications, if you don't know what that is. So a bit about me. I'm a developer advocate for Sonatype. Um, past experience, I used to work at IBM, so I worked on mainframes originally. Yes, the green screens. Um, I worked on WebSphere. Um, I'm a container expert, so I containerized one of the first ever products at IBM. So that's a bit about me. Um, who's heard of Sonatype? Hands up here. Anyone heard of the company Sonatype? Cool, quite a few of you. Awesome. Um, a lot of people know us for Maven Central. Maven Central being the biggest Java open source repository. That is something we just do for the community, but we have lots of other products as well. So most of you might know repository, um, lifecycle, firewall, and we've actually just released a new product called SBOM Manager yesterday. Um, all our colleagues are all at KubeCon um, in Paris. So what am I talking about today? Um, first of all, we're going to talk about why we love open source. Um, some of the supply chain problems we have today with consuming the mass amounts of open source. I'll talk a little bit about what SEA is, so software composition analysis, why security matters, um, a little bit about SBOMs, and then I'll talk about what raw materials are. So why did I create this talk? So uh, one of the first conferences I went to when I was at Sonatype, um, we were in a round table with lots of different people from corporations, um, some big telephone uh, companies based in China, I won't name which ones they are, but they were talking about the concept of raw materials. I was like, what's a raw material? Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. So if you're not familiar with this ship, this is HMS Victory. This is the oldest commissioned warship in the world. Um, this is actually the flagship of the British fleet. So why am I talking about this? Now, this ship has been around for a very long time, and recently it's going under some renovation. So what they found is they started peeling back the layers of the ship that they had been fixing over the years, and underneath everything was rotten, right? But not the original woods. The original materials they used for the ship hundreds and hundreds of years ago were fine. All the stuff we had put on top over the years had started rotting away. Why? Because the raw materials used 400 years ago, the wood we used, was a lot better than the wood we use today. I mean, you can see this in buildings. If you look at the wood in buildings, you'll see only a few circular rings around them, right? Whereas if you look at wood from hundreds of years ago, they have loads and loads of rings because the raw materials we used back then were a lot better. Now, what they're trying to do is they're scanning this whole ship with AI to try and figure out what the best materials to use to fix the ship are to make it last another 300 years. Um, so I'll go back to raw materials a little bit later in the talk, but first of all, let's talk about why open source is amazing. Um, open source, this is a bit of a timeline of open source. It's been around quite a while. Um, open source actually started in 1953. Now, of course, we weren't sharing it on a mass scale like, um, as we are now, and I think things like GitHub have changed the world in terms of how we share code, how we share open source. Um, we all know the benefits of open source, so being able to control, customize, copy, modify, distribute, things like that. Um, and having collaboration, people collaborate from all over the world. I could create a pull request in London, and then the next day it's already been approved because someone in Singapore has checked the code and approved it. So open source is amazing. Um, if we think about current applications, 90% um, of our applications today are open source code, right? We only write 10% of the code that's in our applications. Why do we do that? Because why would we rewrite stuff that already exists, right? We'd rather consume open source code rather than rewrite it. So what is the problem with consuming all of this open source code? Well, if I take an average Java project, for example, there are 150 dependencies in an average Java project. That's 10 releases of those dependencies each year. So now we are having to consider updates of 1,500 dependencies. Bear in mind, 20, 30 years ago, we didn't have to do that at all. So now we've got to keep making sure our applications are up to date. So this is an example of a spring dependency. And you pull in one dependency, that dependency pulls in more dependencies, more dependencies, et cetera, et cetera. But are we actually monitoring the health of these dependencies? Are we paying attention to what's inside of them? I mean, the bad, we've got pretty good networks nowadays. We've got pretty robust firewalls, but the bad people are attacking us every way they can, right? So they're trying to get stuff in public repositories. They're attacking our dev environments. Even the tools we use today are made of open source code. So the bad people are trying to get into our systems any way they can. 
And there's lots of different ways they can do that. Um, and microservice, sorry, I skipped a slide there, so if we can go back. Yeah, so there's lots of different ways they can do that. Dependency confusion, typo squatting, open source repo attacks, build tool attacks. So we've got to be on our toes to make sure we are already protected. And microservices don't make this any easier. When we had one big monolith to look after, yeah, that was fine. Now we've got to update the dependencies in hundreds of services. So this gets even more complicated. So what is software composition analysis? This is something you should be doing if you're not, and this can help us quite a lot. So I know we've had a few cake analogies already at this conference. I'm going to do another one, sorry. Um, but soft, I like to use the cake analogy because essentially a good software composition analysis tool will not look at the cake and say, okay, it's sponge, it's icing, it's some fruit, but it will look at what's inside the sponge, what's inside the fruit. So a basic tool will provide you, say, for example, a list of dependencies, basic information, such as the latest version, but what we really want to know is what dependencies are being pulled in over your main ones. We want to have some vulnerability and license data. Um, project scoring is quite good because you can actually, a lot of companies now are basically giving scores to open source projects to look at the health of those projects. So why does security in open source matter? Okay, so some crazy facts here to get your attention. Um, in 2016, um, and there's lots of different references to this. Um, I actually checked the other day, and this, the number in 2024 is crazy high. But in 2016, cybercrime surpassed the drug trade and what it was making, right? So that's 450 billion US dollars a year, 14,000 US dollars a second. That's equivalent to 50 of the world's biggest nuclear aircraft carriers, right? The US doesn't have that many aircraft carriers. We fast forward to 2022, we are now talking six trillion US dollars a year, right? Now, there are very different sources with that number. Um, like I mentioned, we found a source, you can just Google how much cybercrime makes a year. I think in 2024, it was predicted to be nine trillion US dollars, right? That's 200,000 US dollars a second, equivalent to 620 of the world's biggest aircraft carriers. Now, if cybercrime was the GDP of a country, it'd be the third largest country on the planet, right? So these people are making a lot of money. And if this guy was still alive today, I don't think he'd be selling drugs. He would have a basement of hackers, basically, because drug, uh, drug traffickers, they get caught. They get killed. They get put to prison. Cyber criminals very rarely get caught. And since I started talking, um, currently they have made 420 million US dollars since I started this talk. So it's a crazy, crazy amount of money. Um, and things have changed quite a lot. So if we go back to 2006, when a vulnerability was announced, you had about 45 days to fix that vulnerability. Now, we fast forward to 2021 with stuff like Log4j, that was down to about a day, if less. So we have to be on our toes to make sure we are fixing vulnerabilities as quick as possible. And devices that contain open source code is everything. Insulin pumps have open source code, aircraft, self-driving cars, trains, and it's getting worse. Like, people are finding new ways to attack us. Now, if you haven't heard, there's a lot of countries that are introducing legislation to try and combat this. So I like to use an example. Um, I once had a car that essentially, if you went round and round about too quickly, the airbag would go off. This was a brand new car from a big car manufacturer, right? And they recalled it. Of course they should. I mean, that could kill someone, right? If you're going round and round about and your car airbag goes off. But we don't have any legislation in software to say it needs to be recalled by the government, right? So there's lots of governments around the world that are implementing legislation to make us more responsible for the applications and the code we ship. So the US, the US National Cyber Security Strategy um, essentially requiring everyone to have S-bombs. So if you are shipping any software to the government, you have to provide them with a software bill of materials so they can see exactly what you're shipping and when you're shipping it. Um, the EU is going a little bit too far, in my opinion. They're essentially putting in legislation that makes anyone that's committing to open source projects responsible for those open source projects. So if I work for a company and I commit to an open source project, my company is now liable for anything that goes wrong in that open source project. In my opinion, that's a bit too far, but yes, just an example of some of the legislation that's coming out. And the UK is also trying to introduce some legislation as well. So, S-bombs. Anyone heard of S-bombs? Hands up if you have. 
few of you. Awesome. Okay, stands for Software Bill of Materials. Um, a lot of people are starting to create them, but they're not really doing much with them. Um, there are lots of ways to generate SBOMs. You can use Cyclone DX Maven plugin. Kubernetes has the ability to do it. Um, if you're using build packs, build packs have the ability to create SBOMs. So my advice is to start creating SBOMs as soon as you can, because this essentially gives you a timestamp of what is in your application at a certain time. But now people are even hacking our SBOMs, right? So now they're having to come up with new ways to sign SBOMs to make sure the SBOMs don't get tampered in transit from you to your customer. Um, Sonotype actually released a new product. Um, I think you can try it out for free, um, SBOM Manager, which is a, essentially a way for you to import, manage your SBOMs, things like that. But there's lots of different tools you can use. Um, but my advice is start creating SBOMs as soon as possible and start storing them and doing something with them. Because um, an SBOM is pretty useless if you're not doing anything with it. So if we fast forward, now there is lots of different foundations that are looking to improve our security, right? Um, security, there wasn't really many frameworks around security. I mean, a lot of these didn't exist 10, 15 years ago. So now there is lots of agencies, lots of foundations, lots of places where people are trying to create standards for security. And it's not that difficult to improve security in open source projects. Um, we've identified some different ways um, that essentially rate a project to see how secure it is, how healthy it is. Um, and as you can see, some of the most important things are things like code reviews. If you're not doing code reviews, please start doing code reviews. It can improve your security quite a lot. But there's also really simple things like branch protection. I mean, branch protection, like if you're not protecting your branches on GitHub, then please do, because it will definitely improve your security posture. Um, and small things do make a big difference, like I said. So doing code reviews, um, don't put binaries outside your projects, uh, dependencies pinned to a specific version is not good. Again, secure your branches if you can. So back to the raw materials part. Why did I create this talk? So I was in this conference, and we were at a round table. And essentially, the people from this um, telephone company were saying that they use raw materials because it can bypass all their checks. So what is a raw material? Well, they referred to a raw material as essentially something where you don't know the origin of the code. And if you don't know the origin of the code, you can't kind of assess the posture of that open source project, thus kind of bypassing some of their normal checks that they would go through. Now, this was very scary to me because essentially they were allowing code or open source code where they didn't know the origin, they didn't know who created it, and they were putting it into their software. So that kind of scared me a little bit and made me think, okay, I'm going to create a talk about this. So if we think about it, with the software supply chain, you have suppliers, so your third-party software is open source. It goes into your warehouse, which is essentially your open source repository. It can be internal in your organization. Um, the software development teams are like the manufacturers. And your finished goods is essentially the software you ship, right? But going back to raw materials, because they don't know the origin, they can't check if that project, if that open source thing is healthy. They don't know if there's bad people um, there. So it kind of surpasses a lot of their um, checks. And again, going back to the point I was making earlier, open source code is in everything, in insulin pumps. Now, don't get me wrong, the healthcare industry has a few more checks when it comes to raw materials. They do make sure that it's not bad, and they have a lot of testing, of course. If it's providing you insulin, if it gets hacked, you could die. Um, but in a lot of other things, they don't have these checks, and they just allow this code to go through. So there's lots of different practices I would suggest with software supply chain. Um, you need to think about remediation. Again, SBOMs will help with your application inventory. Um, build and release, what tools you're using, what open source co um, code is in there. Do you have policy controls? So if I try and import something new into my application, um, do I have some control to say, this has a big vulnerability in it. Do not let my developers touch it. Um, so things like that. Um, project consumption, we want to know how healthy it is. And of course, giving back to the community. Like If we're all consuming open source code, we should be giving back and things like that. Um, but again, supplier hygiene is something that just disappears in regards to raw materials. So, and little things can have big impacts. So the difference between the top line of code and the bottom line of code is a CVE. That is a vulnerability. And it's very, very simple to accidentally make that mistake, right? All it is, the difference there, is an equal sign. And that difference in code is a difference between a vulnerability and not a vulnerability. 
So static analysis tools, these are also a really good way to check your code. Um, essentially what it is, is it examines your application source code for stuff like it can enforce standards, um, help insecure coding patterns, measure your test coverage, you can do control flow so you can see what methods are actually being called to see if you are vulnerable, um, and it can do, it check your documentation and requirements. Now, I think these tools are slowly going to evolve, so eventually you kind of, you train them and then train them on how your organization develops, right? And I think this is a really good way to get junior developers to catch up with everyone else because you can get your senior developers to train these tools and essentially have your junior developers learn from them rather than them keep asking the senior developers. Um, they're not quite there yet, but I think that is eventually where they'll get to. So I've gone through this quite quickly, so um, I'm going to summarize and let you all go for lunch. But essentially, my point is here, one day your luck will run out, right? So this is, we run Maven Central, so we have a lot of data on different things. Um, this is a graph of Log4J. Now, if you don't know what Log4J was, um, it was a vulnerability in the Log4J framework that essentially was one of the worst Java vulnerabilities in history, right? I took this this morning, and 33% of downloads of Log4J over the last seven days are that worst vulnerable version in history, right? And to date, we're talking 354,512,192. That's a crazy amount of downloads of the worst Java vulnerability in history, right? So what I kind of want you to all think about, what I want you to take away from today, is essentially um, choose dependencies wisely. Choose your open source stuff wisely, right? So first of all, have a look. Find out what's in your application. If you don't know, you should. Um, so assess those to see if they're vulnerable or they're not. Have an upgrade strategy, right? Don't move to the latest. That is not good practice. Um, you should always try and bump up vulnerabilities to a good version. So finding tools that can give you a bit of insight into what a good version is, is useful. Um, have ongoing security scanning throughout your whole pipeline. So if when you're developing, all the way to testing, to shipping in production, you should have some tools that are constantly monitoring your applications to essentially see if a new vulnerability has been released. And again, when a vulnerability like Log4J does come out, you need a strategy to fix that as soon as possible. So if you've got something like S-bombs and you've got a tool that can put them all together, you can then essentially look through your application, I can search this particular vulnerability or the library, and then it'll tell me exactly where, what applications it's in. And then have a strategy for upgrading those. Because you don't want to be that person I think it was around Christmas time when Log4J came out, and when I, I was still working at IBM at the time, and everyone was running around crazy trying to figure out um, if we were vulnerable. Now, luckily in WebSphere, we didn't have Log4J embedded in our software, so it was okay. Um, but yeah, do, do, do think about this. Now, I want to give some free swag out. Um, if you're willing to fill out a very small form for me, and you can come and collect oh, a light-up bouncy ball, except this one doesn't light up. But yes, <laughs> the rest of them should do. And I've got some cool stickers as well. Um, it's just very simple questions to see who uses our products, how many people know about our products, um, and things like that. There are some. I may want to see the QR code for updating. All right, cool. Um, the next few slides are better. Yeah, so if you can, that'd be amazing. I'll give you some free stuff. I've got these three cool stickers up here, um, which are free to take. Please do take them, because then I don't have to take them home with me and all the bouncy balls. Um, so hopefully you've all got a picture of that. I'll put it back on afterwards. So useful links if you want to know more about how we, what raw materials are, um, how open source is used in medical devices. If you want to know, we have a great website that basically shows you the history of supply chain attacks over the last 20 odd years. Um, and if you want to find out the Log4J data, we do have a dashboard which you can go to to check out basically what's happening there. Um, we're on social media, so get in touch. And if you would like, so there's some more cool stuff here. We've updated Maven Central recently. Um, I don't think a lot of people knew we actually ran Maven Central until we updated it and put our logo on it. And then they all started complaining, oh, Sonatype's running Maven Central. Yes, we have done for like 12 years. <laughs> so we've been running it for a while anyway. Um, me and my colleague, we've actually created a series of articles around software composition analysis. So if you want to know more about that, let us know. Um, if you scan the QR code there, you can get my slides and recordings. Now, I'm just going to put a caveat here. I am not a front-end developer. I am a back-end developer, 
I'm not very good at making websites, so please do not judge my website. Um, my wife, actually, she's, she works in security as well at IBM, but um, she looks at my website and is like, what have you done here? So I was like, well, it's on GitHub if you want to make a pull request, so I'm going to help her with something, and she's going to fix my website for me. But it works, it's fine. Um, just remember, I'm not a front-end developer, so it's not all fancy. So with that, I hope you've enjoyed my talk. I hope you've enjoyed the conference. Thank you very much for having me in Singapore. This is my first time here. It's honestly one of the most beautiful countries in the world. I've always struggled to think what my favorite city is, and this one might top it. So I've got the weekend to explore. I'm with customers on Monday, so I've actually got a weekend to explore, so I'm going to go check it out. But from what I've seen so far, Singapore is just mind-blowingly beautiful. So yeah, congrats on living in an epic place, everybody. But um, yeah, thank you for listening to my talk. If you've got any questions, um, do come grab me afterwards. And yes, if you want a bouncy ball and some stickers, just come and get me. Thank you, everybody.